thrilled that you're joining us for this Easter Sunday, especially because you're ready for this. I'm about to give you some insider talk. How many always want to feel like they're on the inside? Okay, so years ago, roughly 2,000 years ago, there was a man named Jesus who died, went into a grave, and came back out. Well, there were followers of him. Some were disciples. Some had just heard about him, learned about him. And after he came up out of the grave, people were nervous to talk about him because, after all, he was the most wanted man in the entire Roman Empire at that time. And the Pharisees and Sadducees, all these different people group wanted him. So you'd have a group of people walking down the street, another person would be walking by, and they would say this phrase. They'd say, he is risen. And, and that means they knew that Jesus was up and out, you know, because Jesus didn't do what dead people were supposed to do, right? What do dead people do? The dead. Jesus like, nope, bored with this. So he came back and like, ta-da, everything I said was correct. That's actually what he said when he came out of the tomb. Ta-da. So, so they'd be walking down the street and they would say, he is risen. And if they didn't know what they were talking about, and this is in the Greek, they said this phrase, what you talking about, Willis? That's what you have to, you got to really study it, but it's in there. So if they said what you're talking about, then they would just keep walking because you couldn't say, oh, I'm talking about a man named Jesus. You may have heard of him. He was crucified, but now he's back from the dead because you could come under persecution. But then they'd walk and they'd see another people group and they'd go, hey, he, he's risen. And they'd say back, he's risen indeed. <gasps> and then they'd stop and be like, you know it. I know it. You know, it. okay. Oh my gosh. Where did you see him? You saw him in Galilee. You know what I heard? I heard that he walked on water one time. Did you hear about Lazarus? You were there when he raised Lazarus. So now you had these few people, they were able to talk because he is risen. He is risen indeed. So it's kind of insider Christianese talk. So I don't know how you got here today. Maybe someone brought you, maybe you're an insider, but I have this to tell you. He has risen. He has risen. Indeed. He has risen. No, see, I said it. I said it. You got to say it again. That's, a, that's the insider Christian. He is risen. You believe it. Hey, if you're watching us online, feel free to talk to the computer screen. It's a lot more interactive that way. Um, the reason I want to talk to people online is because at the early service, we had a gentleman watching online, 19 years old, at college, took a screenshot, sent a picture to his mom, and said, I finally get it. Oh so if you're watching us online, if you're sitting here, we're thrilled that you're joining in. I have one goal, help you get it. And I don't know if I can accomplish that, but I know the Holy Spirit that is in the lead of our life right now can do it. So we're so thrilled that you're joining us. Make sure to leave a comment. Let us know that you're watching us. And for everybody else, I do want to say this. If you are a first-time guest, if someone dragged you here, if you heard about a water baptism, however it turned out, we are so glad. If you are a first-time guest, we just celebrate that you're here with us right now. Absolutely thrilled. And here's the great thing. I have two small scriptures for you. So this is the best day to be here because I'm not going to overwhelm you with scripture. It's 1 Peter chapter 18 through 19, and we're just going to keep talking about this one thing. Now, I would love, because some of you maybe didn't get a chance to read your Bible today, I would love you to read this to me. Can we do that today? And then when you go, how was Easter? Here's your comment. I read the Bible for the first time. It'll be really tight. You can actually tell people that. So I'll get you started. Ready? First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. For you know... Everyone, catch up, catch up. <laughs> Precious blood of the Christ, a lamb. That, that is just entertaining for a pastor. That's the only reason I did it. I don't know if that helped you, but I'm inside right now. I have a huge grin, so I appreciate you playing along. But here, here's the thing. We, I want to talk to you about this, this one scripture. It's all we're going to talk about today. And if you don't know anything about Jesus, we kind of gave away the ending. He paid for you with his blood. That's the bottom line. That's, that's the big point that we want to talk to you about. It wasn't silver. It wasn't gold. It wasn't diamonds. It wasn't ruby. It wasn't sunken treasure that Jack Sparrow found, okay? It is the precious blood of Jesus Christ that we want to talk to you about. But the word found in the middle of this is very interesting. Do you see the word redeemed? Do you remember saying that? So redeemed right now, if you've been a longtime Christian, we've really kind of turned this into a churchy term. But here's really what it was. It's actually a financial term. So there's something you deem to have value, but you don't have it, so you redeem it. Because you, the reason you had to redo it over, the reason you had to redeem it, because it was put into captivity or slavery. So kind of a way that I would look at this is imagine if you were put into a pawn shop. And I know a lot about this because last week I found myself at a pawn shop. 
Don't judge. I felt it. Don't ju- I got four kids. Daddy's got daddy's to buy groceries. <laughs> and my God, do they keep eating more. So I actually went to a pawn shop because I had this idea, but I didn't know anything about pawn shops. So I went there to kind of figure out what is it that you guys do here. And so they, they were incredibly gracious. They actually gave me one of their contracts. And, and it, when you go in to pawn something. So when you go in to pawn something, uh, you take an item. By the way, you can just sell something to them. But normally what you do is you go in and you say, I want to give you this item. They'll ideally give you about 70% of its value. And in giving that, you now have cash in your pocket. But here's the kicker of it. You're going to have to pay 20% interest per month to keep that item your item. I love this part of it. On the contract, though, they put the interest rate that you'll pay for the year. So if you're paying 20% interest on your contract, it'll say 240% interest. That's the time when you guys are supposed to go, (gasps) so let's try it again. That way it's really interactive. So you'll pay 240% interest a year. Now, what if I told you you were going to make 240% interest a year? Yay! Yeah, I could totally change, right? 240% tell me where to sign up. 240% don't sign up. Like, it's a really bad deal. But you are actually under a legal contract. Actually, I kind of thought, and if you work for a pawn shop, we're so glad you're here right now, but I may bash you for a second. Um, I always, <laughs> not meaning to, like when I thought pawn shop, I kind of thought seedy, right? Like, you know, mafia. Let's just say what it is. So, like, <laughs> But actually, these are very legally binding contracts that the state comes in once a month and actually audits their books to make sure they're doing everything legal, shows up randomly almost once a week just to weigh their scales to make sure they're not doing anybody unjust. So it's a legally binding contract that you keep alive by coming in every 30 days, paying 20% interest just so you can say, I still own that thing. Does that make sense? And as I'm looking at this, I had to almost ask the question, if it's valuable to you, how could you pawn it? Does that make sense? Like, if it really brought value to you, because if you think about it, value is determined by sacrifice. Whatever you're willing to sacrifice the most for is what you value the most. So here's a really practical example. So um, let's say I own a car now and a car when I was 16 years old. The car that I own now, this true story, was given to me. So I didn't sacrifice anything to get it. But when I was 16 and I bought a Z71 Chevy short bed flare side 305, I not know that information. That thing was buffed. That thing was armor-rolled. That thing was shined all the time, right? This one with kids, it usually gets gas and oil. Right? By the way, does anyone have a minivan with goldfish under every booster chair? Can I get a shout out to my, thank you. I need to encourage you today. Maybe you came just for this. Keeping a clean house with kids is like trying to brush your teeth eating Oreos. Just give up on it. Just enjoy life and vacuum goldfish later. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this car I had to sacrifice to buy, so I cleaned it. I cared for it. It had greater value to me than the car that was given to me. It means a lot, but what did I really have to sacrifice to get it? And, and it, this, it's true in life because in life, when you start buying toys, let's say, for instance, you buy a motorcycle, a car, a, uh, a jet ski or boat, and a condo and you have a wife and kids, and you spend all your time with your motorcycle, your jet ski, your helium balloon, and I forgot everything I mentioned, and condo, because I'm clearly not in this category. I have four kids. I already tried to mention that to you. But you have all your toys over here, and your wife and kids, and you spend all your time, energy, and money with your boat, your car, your motorcycle, and your condo. Which one do you value more? The stuff, right? Because that's what you're sacrificing to be with. But here's the flip side. What if you owned a motorcycle, a car, a boat, and and a condo, but you never spend time with it? You only spend time with your kids and your wife. Even though you have this stuff that may have some value to it, the intrinsic value of what you love is actually over here on the other side. So the way to know what you value the most is you have to determine what you sacrifice most time, money, and energy to be with. Does that make sense? And so in this, this is what I have to say. We have to speak of sacrifice is knowing if someone values you. Okay, so I told you I was only going to tell you about 1 Peter. Now let me tell you a story. All the way at the beginning of time, there was a guy named Abraham, or excuse me, Adam and Eve. Abraham came later. He was there early, but I need Abraham. 
Adam and Eve. Thank you. Why don't you guys come on up? You're apparently doing better than I am right now. Adam and Eve were in the garden and God loved them. Why did God love them? He spent time with them. He spoke to them. He created them. Have you ever made something? Anything you make probably has a lot of value to you, right? Because you put your time and energy. And God said to Adam and Eve, he said, listen, the earth is yours. And I need you to steward and I need you to manage it. Next thing you know, the enemy comes up and the enemy goes, listen, I want what you have, which is ultimately you. And I value you so much that I will lie to you to get it. Think about this. So now Adam and Eve, they actually believed the lie. So Satan took who they were, put them into captivity and slavery. Or could I say this? He took them and put them in a pawn shop. And he now legally owns them. And let me tell you how much value you have to Satan. You have so much value that years later when Jesus was walking the earth, Satan goes, hey, Jesus, you see all this kingdom? You see all this stuff? You see all these cars, these boats, these iPads, these, these condos? You see all these people? If you just bow down and worship me, I will freely give this to you. That's how much value you had. Actually, you have so much value to Satan that it says that he seeks to who he can kill, still and destroy. Like he loves you so much that he doesn't mind walking into the pawn shop of life, pulling you off the shelf, putting you on the ground and crushing you. Actually, he would do anything for you to stop making a monthly payment so he could own you. And okay, so right now I see you looking at me and you're like, wow, you're talking a lot about like Satan and God. And I don't normally hear you talk about like the good and the bad. Listen, Satan's real and so is God. So on this Easter Sunday, I don't mind talking about him because just so you know, we win. Hallelujah. I'll give you another. I didn't see it coming either. So I'll give you another run. We win. There it is. So on, online, type amen right now. I don't know why you have to type that many letters for amen, but go ahead and do it a bunch with estimation points. So, like, so when it comes to our value to Satan, he was ready to throw us away just for Jesus to worship us, for Jesus to worship him. He seeks to kill, still, and assure you. And if you go, well, listen, I got to be honest with you, Pastor. Uh, I don't believe in God and the Bible and let alone this whole Satan thing. Okay, I think you do believe what I'm talking about. Maybe not the characters involved, if I could say it that way. And the reason why I would say it is that when it comes to, because it says he redeemed us from the emptiness of life. If I would say to you right now, you've experienced the emptiness of life. Just let that sit there. You'd probably go... No, I think I probably have felt the emptiness of life. You know, is life meaningless? You ask this question, you read the scripture, is life meaningless? Or isn't there more for me? Have you ever felt in your life like I was created to do more than this? Is is my only purpose in life, you ready for this? Wake up in the morning, eat, go to work, come home, go to sleep, and repeat. Repeat. Even saying that, don't you kind of go, that's my purpose in life? I was only supposed to be here to exist, not to live. I was supposed to do do and not thrive. Like even if you don't believe in God and Satan inside of you right now, you're going, no, there has to be more in this. Why? Because I've been trying to find something more in life than myself. So I've been searching for things outside of me. So I decided to try food and I ate a lot of it and I only became fat because the next day I had to eat it again. I, I tried smoking and I started out with, you know, a pinch hitter. Then I went to a joint and now I'm buying a bag at a time. I started to fill myself with a little bit of pornography and then I had to do it more than once a week. And now I go to bed every night looking at it, which, by the way, it continues to increase, but it can never consume me enough. And you've been searching your whole life, seeking something to fill yourself. It's the reason you're on your eighth relationship this year. Because you're thinking she or he will give you something that you need. But the reality of it is you still don't understand your purpose because you may be on the pawn shelf of life. You don't even know that you're in captivity. You don't even know that someone sold you into slavery. You don't even know that you need to be ransomed, redeemed, and in order to become who you are. And so in saying that, I want to let you know this, though. You can't set your own value. How many have ever met someone, and just if they're with you, you're not allowed to bump them. It'll be really awkward right now. Have you ever met someone, an employee, uh, a partner, uh, even someone at school or work that just believes they're more valuable than they actually are? 
Like they tell you how great they are. I said no elbows. Come on, guys. We need ushers fourth row left. No, I, like <laughs> that was really specific. Sorry about that. And it's third. Um, it, like <laughs> I'm not allowed to laugh at my own jokes, and it's two weeks in a row now. So, like, like at some point, have you ever met someone that always told you how awesome they were, and you were like, I don't quite see it. Or maybe there was another employee, and here's, what, here's how they say it. Like, I should be getting paid more. You don't know what I bring to this company. Actually, I think everybody else but you does know, <laughs> right? Because a value isn't set by the person. The value is set by the person giving. Or can I say this? The one sacrificing. And you're valuable to Jesus, not because of your gifts. You're valuable not because you showed up today, that you can preach that you can sing, that you can dance, that you can run a camera. You're not valuable because you have degrees. You've started your own business. You're a good employee. You're a stay-at-home mom. You're a faithful husband. You're not, you're not valuable for any of those reasons. You're valuable because someone else set your value and said you are valuable. And by the way, I, so I'm trying to make a spiritual example here. But I think it's easier to make the spiritual example once we understand it, naturally speaking. Because every day you go to work... Someone is setting your value, right? Because I'm going to come in. I'm going to give you of my time. They're going to sacrifice their money to say you're worth $22 an hour. I think I'm worth more than $44,000 a year. I think I'm worth $150,000 a year. Find someone to pay you $75 an hour then. Until that, you're not that valuable, Right? And if you're here and you go, well, listen, I'm an entrepreneur. I set my own salary. Actually, it's a little more difficult for you. Now you have to find a bunch of homeowners or individuals to help set your value. Because I can tell you now, I think my preaching's worth a million dollars a year. No one's called. And I remember, I learned this lesson the hard way, maybe a little embarrassing. A while back, uh, just so you know, I love building houses, getting set, finding out we can make money and sell the houses. Like, I just, I, I love them. But this one house, it was beautiful. And we had so many great memories in it. And I knew it was time to sell. So, you know, I don't want you to judge me, but I was going to list our house for $1.3 million. And it's a beautiful house. And my wife decorated it. And we have, we have the interior, just, it's gorgeous. But I also have these great memories there's one memory of my little baby girl. She was in the shower, and she backed up to the little glass door, and I got a picture of her booty on it. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's, oh my, can I say that? It's priceless. And I remember wrestling with the boys in the basement. I remember being in the backyard playing soccer. I did more suplexes on our trampoline than a wrestler. I can't even, none came to mind there. Let's go with Hulk Hogan. We all know him. I know names. I was being facetious. So um, I, I remember doing burn pits in the back and roasting marshmallows. And when I took all the memories that I had of this house and added it up, it had a value of $1.3 million. And I had an agent come in and I told them, and they said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> they said, I don't mind listing it, but first of all, we have to take an entire comma off of what you think this is worth. <laughs> like a million dollars, this is my family's house. They said, yeah, but at the end of the day, it's a four bedroom, like <laughs> we're bringing this way down. And when you say 300, well, how about let's start at two and we'll start talking. And all of a sudden I went, you know what it was? The buyer can't set the value or the seller doesn't set the value, the buyer does. Because I can all day long tell you that I'm worth this much and my house is worth this much, but if you don't write a check, you know what it's worth? nothing. I can tell you all day long, I'm a great person and I deserve to go to heaven. But until someone sets my value, I'm always going to be on the pawn shelf of life. And this is a great thing. And by the way, I think some of you have kind of seen where I'm going with the scripture because you need to be redeemed from this meaningless life that you've had, but you can't set your own value. It's upon someone else to determine your value. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ walked into the pawn shop of humanity. And he looked across the sea of people like you. And you look in yourself going, well, if he knew what I did, and if he knew how I acted, and if he knew what I thought, and if he heard what I said last night, and be honest, I'm a little hungover a little bit today, and I'm standing here and he's talking to me. Jesus looked around and said, I'm ready to set a value. Satan goes, good luck. You know why? They're under contract with me. 
And they've been making their monthly payments. And just if you're familiar with the Old Testament, they've been going to a temple, sacrificing an animal, and kicking the payment down the road. But Jesus, I can tell you now, at 240% interest, they cannot and have not and will not ever be able to pay this bill. And Jesus is looking at it going, you know, I hear you saying that, but just so you know, I've been looking at the calculations, I've been doing the math in my own head, and I'm pretty sure I can pay for that. And by the way, he didn't pay for it, as the scripture tells us, with gold and silver, with diamonds or rubies. He didn't pay for it with that. He paid for it with his blood. And I love when you look at his checkbook, his checkbook wasn't forced to be written in blood. He freely gave that. Because you can read the scriptures and goes, oh, those Pharisees and those Sadducees, the religious of those days were too powerful they overtook Jesus. No, that's not true. You can say, well, the Roman Empire, with its great strength and might, they owned all the world. Actually, when they came to arrest him and said, Who are, we're looking for Jesus, he says, I am he. Do you know that all the soldiers fell back under the power of his three words? He didn't give of himself because he was too weak to defend. But he was so strong, he freely gave. It wasn't nails that held him to a cross on that day. It wasn't the crown of thorns or a sword that pierced his side or a whip that beat his back. It was love that signed that checkbook in blood. His love put us on this. And when he wrote this, when he said it, here's what he said. I'm here to redeem you. I'm here to take this contract that humanity has been under for thousands of years that you haven't been able to pay it, and I'm ready to pay it in full. And I'm ready to call you my own. And here's the most beautiful thing about this. I need to take it a step further. He didn't just redeem you. He wants you out of the pawn shop of life. He didn't redeem you to leave you in the store. He didn't re redeem you so that you don't understand your value. He didn't redeem you to leave you behind. He redeem redeemed you so that you would know your full purpose and value that you are to him. He didn't redeem you so that you could come to church on a Sunday morning to then live like hell Monday through Saturday. And by the way, when I say live like that, I'm not saying that you yourself are just out running around. I'm talking about when you leave here, you feel good. I promise you, I know the reason people keep coming back to church. And here's why. When you get done, you feel good. You've touched God. You worship with like-minded believers. And there's something about you that picked up. Then somewhere along the line, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I don't know what day it is, you remember why life was bad. You remember guilt. You remember shame. You remember addiction. You remember pornography, drugs. You remember all those type things. Then you start having shame come back on your life. He did not redeem you from the pawn shelf of life so that you could go back feeling like you were still in hock. He redeemed you so that he could free you so you could find the purpose that you were created for. You are not an accident. There's someone in here that you need to hear this today. You're not the oops baby. You're not an accident. You're not someone that God forgot or humanity once left behind. No one wants you to kill yourself. No one wants you to die. And if you're hearing those words, you're hearing it from the pawn shop owner. And he is a thief, and he's a liar, and he's trying to kill you. But I know a guy that came in and paid it all. Amen. And he paid it with his blood because he loved you enough to set his value on you. And I, and I just so you know, I can feel your internal wrestling right now. You're saying this, but if you really knew who I was. Okay, earlier I gave you some insider talk. You may remember it. He is risen. He is risen I, you guys, a, a plus for today. There it is. So here's your next insider talk. Um, you are thinking that if someone knew everything about you, that there's no way they would accept you. But for all of us Christians that have been doing this for a while, you ready for this? None of us share our whole testimony. There's things about me that I would be embarrassed for people to know. I give you some of my testimony. I share with some of my story. By the way, can I get an amen from some other Christians that may believe? Like, 
Okay, so you don't feel alone right now, because right now you're kind of going, no, I don't think, I think he's by himself. He's had to say this, because if he said who he was, they're out of here, and he won't make a million dollars a year, right? Like, no, no, it's not about that. Here's what it's about. It's about, there's aspects of my salvation process that I want to share with you, that I want to tell you, but there's also things that I feel like are so dirty, so ugly, so nasty, that if anybody really knew this side of me, would they actually love me? And when I still believe that Jesus loved me. When I still thought that Jesus redeemed me, when I still had that mindset, he came to the pawn shop and got me out. So if you're sitting here going, no, 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 I, Pastor, you grew up in a Christian home and mom and daddy who loved you and gr- congratulations, you drank a beer and smoked some weed. Good job, Pastor. But if you knew, what if I tell you that we've had people at the early service that they were suicidal to the point of doing it but they were baptized today because they were free. People that walked away from God, absolutely. What if I tell you that there's someone getting baptized in the next service that I haven't had a chance to meet yet, because, or he's getting baptized in this service because last service he said yes to Jesus, went home to get clothes, and he's back now to get baptized. Here's the thing. No one anywhere under any circumstances, is beyond the reach of the blood of Jesus, the love of Jesus. If you're here today, I'm, I have the greatest desire than you can possibly imagine to get you out of hock, to get you out of a high interest, no return, life-sucking slavery. And I have beautiful news for you. The bill's already been paid. But it's you recognizing what he did for you. So if you're here right now, maybe your heart's been beating. Maybe your mind's going, I get it. Maybe you're saying, okay, he's speaking a language. I don't, I don't know everything what Jesus did, but I know this, that I'm tired of living a meaningless life. I want to have value and purpose. And if there's a man who did that for me and can help me do that, I want to attach myself to him. If that's you today, I'm going to ask you a really simple question. Do you want to receive what Jesus did for you? And in order for me just to talk to you, can I ask everyone just to simply close your eyes, bow your head, kind of, the goal here is that no one feels pressure to respond. No one feels pressure to do anything. No one feels like someone's looking at them at this time. Because the only thing I want you focused on is a savior who values you so much, he would sacrifice himself for you. If you're here today and you're tired of living a meaningless, purposeless life, if you feel like you're on the, pawn, on the shelf of a pawn shop and you're ready to get free from that slavery and that bondage and you want to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to simply just ask you to raise your hand in the air just so that I can identify that you've made that decision this morning. If that's you, just put your hand in the air right now. I see those hands. Praise God. I see those hands. I see those hands there. Praise God. hands up all over the place today. You know, there's so many. Can we all say this prayer together? Dear Jesus, I believe that love held you to the cross. And today, pay my debt in the pawn shop of life. Free me so that I can find purpose and meaning. Forgive me of my sins. Become Lord of my life. Dear Jesus, I do believe that there's some that have made a life-changing decision today, that there's some that planned on coming to church, maybe for the sake of a friend, maybe because someone invited them, maybe they heard about us, but God, they came here today expecting to walk out the same, but now you've interacted with them and you've changed them forever. Lord, I choose along with every other believer in this room right now to now get them off the shelf, out the front door believing that a new journey awaits them. I pray for all those mindsets that a pawn shop would have for you, that you're under captivity, that you're under slavery. I pray for those pawn shop mentalities to be gone in the name of Jesus. And I pray they see that they're now a son and a daughter of a king, a king with riches, a king with influence, a king with power. I pray that they understand today that they have been born again. And we accept these gracious gifts that you've given to us. 
In the name of Jesus, we pray. If you agree with that, can you put your hands together and celebrate with those?